Thank you for listening to this message from Fusion Church. You can listen to more messages online at fusionbz.com. Turn in your Bibles with me, if you would, to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to do a small recap of last week, just so we can jump right in. Last week we had a little bit of a runaway in the worship. The, the Holy Spirit just took over and we had such an awesome time. And in doing so, uh, I had to kind of condense what I was doing, which is perfectly fine. But now I'm kind of jumping in in the middle of something because I didn't have time to get to a good stop in place. So we'll just do a quick recap. Um, last week we talked about the pulse of purpose. It was an, it, to me, I felt like we had one of the best services we've had in, in probably the last year. It was just phenomenal. But it's a re- your pulse being the daily reminder that God isn't finished with you yet. If your heart is beating, God still has purpose and calling for you to fulfill. And, uh, you know, we talked about how we should be driven to discover that purpose. And that purpose is actually the purpose of life. Not, not, not to, to, you know, that we needed to stop looking for the purpose of life and then f- instead find our purpose so that we have life. Does that make sense? Because your purpose is not to make your life better. Your, your life was given for this purpose. Purpose is the meaning. Amen? Um, we ended in 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, where they said the place that we dwell is too small for us. We said they, had, they all had a part in, in going somewhere greater. Nothing amazing happened until they began to move. And how there were challenges, even when they were going the right way, right? There's, there's, there's still challenges. Yeah, the challenges were met with divine help. This, the, the, when you go back and read that story of, of, of Elisha and, and, and what's going on there, and, and the king wants to, to stop this prophet from giving away all of his secrets because God is just revealing to this prophet all of the plans of, of, of this evil king, and, and he wants to put a stop to that, so he sends all their men out to encircle the, the place where he is, and and we know the story, the, 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 the servant goes out and he sees the army surrounding the city and he gets scared and he runs in. He tells the prophet and the prophet says, it's all right. Can I tell you if the enemy has surrounded you in battle, if you're encamped, entrenched, it's all right. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. God has had a plan before the enemy ever come up with a plan. God knew how he was going to defeat the devil before the devil decided to attack. Can you say Amen. But had it not been for the call and the purpose that these men had when they said this place is too small for us, none of these things could have ever happened. I wonder how many things God has wanted to do, but he hasn't yet been able to do it because more of us haven't found our purpose that opened the door to see God move. Can you say amen? Uh, Sometimes, and you, you, I know I'm, I'm kind of in and out here, but just give me a minute as I set it all back up, right? <laughs> Sometimes the life that we live is too small for us. Sometimes we just get so ingrained in our family, our home, our, 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 our businesses, our, our church, our ministry, all of our obligations, all of our duties, all of our priorities. Sometimes... And bear with me, but sometimes the world that we have created for ourselves is just too small for God to be able to do all of the things that he wants to do both in you and through you. And because of that, God puts you in stretching times. He puts you in times where you are stretched beyond what seems like your capacity or your limit. You get frustrated, you get tired, you get overwhelmed, you get bewildered. All of the time uh, that this is going on, the enemy is trying to tell you to quit. The enemy is trying to tell you you're not good enough. The enemy is trying to tell you that it's not worth it. But if you just step back and can see in the spirit what's really going on in those times of stretching so often is just God bringing you to a place of greater capacity so that he can put more in you and thus do more through you. Can you say amen? <clears throat> Sometimes the very purpose for our suffering is to enable the purpose for which we are called. And Paul said this, he said, I have not yet apprehended that which I was apprehended for. I have not yet got a hold of or become what God has called me to be. And he understood that the sufferings and the things that he was going through and the limitations that he was facing, although they were a hindrance today, 
they would not keep him from fulfilling the call and the plan and the purpose that God had for him. I haven't yet become what God has called me to be, but I will be. I might look like I'm battling. I might look like I'm hindered. I might look like I'm struggling. I might look like I'm in bondage. But God has already got a hold of me. And when he is done in this trial, you will find that I am greater than I have ever been before. Somebody say, stretch me. Just getting by just making it through, just keeping things together will will never bring us to that place of fulfillment and blessing that God wants you to find, that place of abundant life. Money, stuff, homes, wealth, all of that is too small to be the center of your focus. None of that is your purpose. Even even honestly, in some ways, your ministry is is not really your purpose. Your, your ministry is just the tools God uses in your life to help you fulfill that purpose. You, you know what the number one purpose of my life is? The number one purpose of my life? And I think if you search your heart after I say this, you're probably going to agree that it, it's probably supposed to be the number one purpose of your life too. The number one purpose of my life is fellowship with God. To know Him as He knows me. To hear his voice. And then the number two purpose of my life is to walk in obedience that flows out of that fellowship. Don't get it switched. If you put obedience before fellowship, you'll never have fellowship. Religion teaches it backwards. They tell you you have to get obedience first. And if you have obedience, then you can have fellowship. That is not what the Bible says. That is not the plan of the word of God. When you look at how it plays out in people's lives, when you look at what it says, that is not what the Bible teaches. We have fellowship with him and his fellowship strengthens and enables us to walk in obedience. And if you don't put fellowship first, all you'll have is religious duty. And that never obeys God. It just becomes self-righteousness. Can you say amen? Amen. Fellowship first. And out of that fellowship is where I find the well of love and ability to love my neighbor. It takes a well of love and ability just to cause a human being to be able to love their neighbor. And then Jesus comes along and says, love your enemies. (laughs) Look, my neighbor was rough, but (laughs) now... You see, he always calls you beyond your capacity because he knows that in fellowship with him, he will stretch your capacity. He will fill you to the overflow. David says, my cup runneth over because God has over flooded my capacity. That's how I can love my enemy. That's how I can love my neighbor. That's how I can turn the other cheek. That's how I can bless them that curse me and do good to them that despitefully use me. It's not because I have great character. It's because the overflow of the Holy Spirit in my life causes me to go beyond myself and do more than I could naturally do. And yet when you talk to Christians about this, they say, well, I'm just human, I have limits. Yeah, we know. It's not like you're so great we didn't recognize you have limits. It's that God doesn't have limits. And if you would quit looking at your limits and look at his word and what he says and then trust and believe that what he says he'll do in you, you can love your neighbor. You can forgive those that mistreat you. You can let it go. Let it go. Come on, Elsa is better off than half the people in church. Because she learned how to let it go, amen? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. By the way, the title of my message today is the fulfillment of purpose. I'm not talking about fulfilling your purpose. I'm talking about you being fulfilled, operating in your purpose. The life of fulfillment, satisfaction, and joy flows out of your purpose. Make every effort to keep, this is the Amplified Bible, by the way, make every effort to keep the oneness of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I I love the fact that he starts off with this first. He's like, first of all, stay in unity. 
If you don't stay in unity, you can't do any of the rest of this. Stay in unity. How do I stay in unity when I'm so different from everybody else? Any, anybody know what it means when, when, when they call you a black sheep? When they, when they call you a black sheep, it just means you're different than the whole rest of the flock. Anybody ever feel like a black sheep? Me and three other people, all the rest of you just fitting right in, huh? Yeah, you are. You're just like everybody else. I would be fearful if I was just like everybody else. Because God is unique, amen? I have found that as a child, I was the black sheep of my family. I was just different than everybody. And then I found when I got into ministry, I was still the black sheep because I was different from everybody. I know I'm, I'm a white guy, and some of you have a hard time connecting a white guy with a black sheep, but it ain't about color. My oldest brother is a Jew. His name is Jesus. He was the firstborn. Y'all are looking at me kind of funny now. You understand that everywhere I go and everything I get involved with, I'm, I always feel like the black sheep. And I used to really struggle, and then I didn't understand why am I so different from everybody else. And then one day I realized I'm different because everybody's different. Can, can I, can I tell you? You are never more you than when you're different from everybody else. The fitting in and being like everybody else, that's the pretense. That's the phoniness. That's the act. The real you is supposed to be different from everybody else. And what happens is when you begin to find fellowship and affirmation from the Holy Spirit, God begins to affirm who you are. You no longer care if you're like everybody else. And there's a freedom and liberty to just be in the weird me that I am. It don't even bother me when it embarrasses my wife most of the time. Because you begin to realize that the, the purpose God called you to is different than everybody else's purpose. The, the places God is going to use you is different. The way he's going to use you is different. The, the giftings and all the things that he, it's all different from everybody else around you. So if I was just like you, how could I do what I'm supposed to do? Me and Brendan make a great team. I get the stuff on the top shelf. And he says, thank you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we play football together because I hit him high and he hits him low. And nobody's got a chance. <laughs> Make every effort to keep oneness in the spirit in the bond of peace. How do you stay in unity when we're all so different? Because, you know, since we're different, our perspectives are different. Our, 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 the way we analyze is different. You see it from this side. I see it from that side. How do we stay in unity if we're all different? And it's very simple. Are you ready? It's one spirit. So when you line up with the one spirit, that's where you find unity. We go around rejecting everybody for their differences. You're never going to have unity. When you reject everybody because they don't do it like you, don't look at it like you, don't feel like it like you, all you're doing is you're creating division in a place that God is trying to create unity. We look at ministries and we discard the ones that don't do it the way we like, the way they do it. Well, you, when you speak, you should speak like this. You know, you should never leave the podium. Well, too bad. I don't ever stand at the podium very long. Does that mean God can't move? Of course not. When you prophesy, you should do it. When I was a kid, to prophesy in church, you had to get up and say, thus saith the Lord. Like, we're all so stupid, we don't know you're prophesying. If you don't start it with, thus say it the Lord. Hello? We get things down until we try to just make cookie cutters out of everything and make everybody exactly the same. And we think that that's unity, but that's not unity. And the reason why that can't be unity is because God didn't call me to be like that. So I can't be one with the Spirit if I'm pretending to be something I'm not. I first got to be one with the Spirit. Then we can find unity together. Because God's not going to lead me to reject you and discard you because you don't hold your head right or you don't write with your right hand or you write with your left hand or you don't start your sentences like this or you say words like you ones. Ain't my fault you're from Canada and can't pronounce project correctly. Just kidding. It's a private joke between me and some friends. There is one body of believers and one spirit just as you were called to one hope when called to salvation. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of us all, 
who is sovereign over all and working through all. Look at the person beside you and recognize God is working through them. He's working on them. It's about what God is doing. And when you recognize that, then you would quit rejecting everybody when you see things about them that you don't think is right. Well, I just don't think if they were a Christian, they would do that way. I don't think you know what it means to be a Christian. Because being judgmental and haughty certainly is not being Christ-like. Come on. Jesus loves sinners. And if you can't love that sinner and lead them to salvation, what good are you to the kingdom of God yourself? I didn't know it was going to be so hard this morning. I'm surprised too. He says, yet grace. Somebody say grace. His, the Amplified calls it God's undeserved favor, and it is, but it's more than that. I want you to understand that, that grace has more than one aspect. You know, I'm a father, and I'm a man, and I'm a pastor, and I'm a child of God. All at the same time. And the same way grace really can't be defined by one terminology because it's just too powerful for that. It is God's undeserved favor. You didn't earn it. You can't earn it. You just have to receive it because he loved you enough to give it to you. That tells you the requirements of what grace is, but that doesn't tell you what grace does. Because it's his unmerited favor, that means he's pouring some things into me and onto me that I didn't deserve. But what's he pouring onto me? Well, one of the things he's pouring onto me is the empowerment of God to do anything and everything he's called me to do. To walk in the fullness of his holiness and godliness that he has poured out to me. So it's not just unmerited favor, it's also the empowerment of God to operate in spiritual giftings that he's given me, to operate in the call that he's given to me, to operate in the positions that he's given me as a father, as a husband, as a child, as a pastor, as a leader, as a teacher. All of these things operate out of that grace that God poured on me. I didn't deserve to get it. He chose it. He planned it. Before you were formed in your mother's womb he said I knew you that grace is what he's talking about he said yet grace you know he's talking about how all this unity all this oneness everything's the same and then he says because there's one God and one spirit and you know he's doing all this yet in other words we're, we're looking at something else now in the midst of all this unity yet Grace was given to each one of us, not indiscriminately, but in different ways. Look at your neighbor and tell him, you're just kind of different. That's permission, by the way, to just be different. You just heard it. That's who you are. You're just different, and it's okay. I've always been different. You've always been different. It's our differences that make us so powerful when you put us together. Amen? I don't know what you're saying about me down there. They all knew I was different. Amen? <laughs> he said, in proportion. This grace, was, uh, this, this grace was given to us in proportion to the measure of Christ's rich and abundant gift. That means he gives me exactly the same amount of grace that I need to operate in the gifts that he gave me to operate in. Okay, now, if we're so different that he has to measure out your grace for your gifts and your grace for your gifts and your gifts are differing, how is it we're supposed to come to church and all be alike? You see, instead of celebrating the uniqueness that God called us to so that we can find our own unique, divinely appointed purpose, the only place in God where you're going to find the fullness of his will, the fullness of his plan, the fullness of his uh, joy and peace and empowerment, the only place you're going to find your fullness is when you find the purpose that he called you to. And all of that is discovered when you recognize 
the grace he's given me to operate in the gifts I'm called in. You know what that means? When I see things outside of my gifting, I don't have to stress about doing things I'm not called to do. I was listening to the, um, Maxwell the other day. And John Maxwell said, there's three things I'm gifted to do. Three. And I put all of my time and attention in doing those three things God called me to do. Everything else, I have somebody else to do that. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. You see, we, I was raised in a different train of thought. I was raised in a train of thought that said, well, it's the same Holy Spirit in all of us, so you can all do all of it. And so you got people out there trying to do things they're not called and graced and gifted to do, and they don't understand why it's not working. And then you have, everybody smile at me real big while I tell you this part, ready? Then you have the wannabes who think they know how you ought to do what you're called to do, and they're always trying to correct and tell you how you ought to do what you ought to do when they ain't got no idea they've never been called to do what you've been called to do. I think that falls in the line of busybodies. Because what I find is when I'm, when I'm really focused enough to, to, to somewhat be able to fulfill some of the purpose that God has called me, to be able to fill the purpose God has called me to fulfill, I have to be so focused on that, I can't possibly sit around and tell everybody how to do theirs. When I was a kid, they wrote a country song and it said something like this. If you mind your own business, you won't be minding mine. I think it should have been a gospel song myself. <laughs> you know, when I was young, and, and I don't say this to, to give it credit, but when I was young, I was in some unsavory places that good Christian people ought not to go. And not one time in any of those places did anybody sit around and tell everybody else what they ought to do. They were too busy just enjoying their stupidity. How is it that we come into a church and the fullness in the presence of an almighty God who is both convicting and enabling, calling and equipping, loving and chastening, all at the same time. And yet we have time to look around and see what everybody else is doing. I don't, look at me, I don't think you can. You're either receiving or you're looking. I don't think you can do both. And I think that to be the church that the church ought to be, we just need to be a lot more focused on us fulfilling our purpose. You know, the people that I have met over the years who create the biggest problems by going around and judging everybody and criticizing when the church ought to do this and the pastor ought to do that and the Sunday school teacher ought to do this and the song leader ought to sing this song and the song leader shouldn't wear that. Every person like that I've ever met all have one thing in common. You know what it is? They ain't doing nothing themselves. Nothing. Because you can't. The reason why, listen, I know this sounds bad, but just bear with me as I, as I break it all together, okay? The reason why they're complaining all the time is because they're so miserable because they've never found their purpose. And they think if they get everybody to do it the way they think they ought to do it, they're going to find that fulfillment and joy. And so they're blaming everybody else for their lack of fulfillment and joy. And their lack of fulfillment and joy comes from one place, never finding what God has for them to do because in His presence is fullness of joy. Now the right hand are pleasures everlasting. Come on, somebody. If we would just let our individual hearts, I'm not talking about a group, I'm talking about you. Look at somebody and say, he's talking to you right now. You find your purpose. You find your calling. You build that relationship with God where you hear his voice. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to preach with my hand in my pocket. I'm playing with my Tic Tacs while I'm preaching. <laughs> you know why? Anybody know why I walk when I preach? It helps me. <laughs> It keeps my mind on what I'm saying instead of everything else. I'm occupying the left side of my brain so the right side of my brain can do its job. Can you say amen? It's called OCD <laughs> and ADD and ADHD, and I don't care because Jesus made me just how I am and uses me anyway. Somebody say amen. 
You see, he speaks about unity and the bond of peace, but then shows how diverse we are in that unity. You know why he's doing that? Because when you discover your differences, it's really easy to focus on the difference and then try to judge everybody because we're different. And he's saying, no, 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 that's not the point. <laughs> I made your differences so you could be one. I brought you together to accomplish more with you in your differences than you can do on your own. If everybody just played the guitar, worship could get kind of boring. And I love the guitar. Amen? But you know, it takes a little bit different gifting and mindset and talent to be able to play the piano than it does to play a guitar. I'm serious. I know some people, you got people like Alex who can play everything. God bless you. <laughs> but like I can play, I, I tried to play the piano and I can do a couple of chords, but it just all gets so complex after that. My brain don't work that way. A guitar I can do pretty good. Some of y'all don't even know that, do you? Huh. But in our differences, we're just able to do more. According to the gift that we've been given, your grace to do and, and uh, what your your grace to do what you're gifted to do, and, and when you discover that, it reveals your purpose. Don't come up to me after church and say, How do I find my purpose? Your relationship with God, time spent in prayer will reveal the command of God in your life to begin to do things. And as you operate in obedience to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you're going to discover your gifting. You're going to discover the grace of what God has called you to do. And in the middle of that, it all draws the picture of your purpose. I know it would be great if we could go to a super spiritual meeting and get some great men of God to just walk around and lay hands on everybody and tell you exactly what you're called to do. But you know, Jesus doesn't do it that way. I kind of laugh when I hear about these conferences. Yeah, I went to this conference and I did this big sheet and he told me what my giftings and what my purpose were. No, it shows you what your tendencies were. It can't reveal your purpose. That has to come from fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? But when you discover that purpose, you will find that you are... It's funny, they call it a calling. It called me. I didn't call it. I, I never got up one morning and said, you know, I think I would like to be a preacher. If I just try hard enough and learn hard enough and study hard enough and practice enough and stand in the mirror. And I, by the way, I've never stood in the mirror and preached to myself, ever. What I have done is after they recorded a few was go back and, and watch it. And I thought, I can't, I can't do this. So, so I, don't, I, I don't watch myself. That's too hard. My wife did a women's conference this weekend, and Miss Rachel took a short video clip of it and then sent it to her. And so I was watching it, and she's laying in bed beside me while I'm watching her teach, and she's like, shut it off. I can't stand to watch it. I understand that. But you got to understand, please, it's through fellowship and commitment to God and walking in obedience that you begin to discover where your gifts are which reveals where God has graced you, which will lead you down the road to discovering your purpose. Jeremiah said it like this. He had determined that he wasn't going to speak the word of the Lord anymore. He had been beaten. He had been humiliated. He had been shamed. He had been locked. All these things, bad things had happened because he was speaking the word of the Lord. And he said, I'm not doing this anymore. This costs too much. I'm done. And then he said, but his word was like a fire shut up in my bones. Can I tell you that the purpose of God is burning to get out of you. The purpose of God is yearning and longing to be fulfilled in your life. And if you will just focus on the Lord and spend some time seeking and in fellowship with God, it is not very hard to discover the things that He has gifted and graced you to do and realize that purpose. It happens because there's a burning and a longing in you. And the people that never find that, that's part of the reason why they're not fulfilled and they're not satisfied and they're miserable and they're grumpy and they're blaming everybody else and they're complaining all the time because there's a burning in them that they've never found figured out how to satisfy purpose with it you find fulfillment and without it you never will is this all right this morning stop trying to be great outside your measure what that means is stop trying to tell everybody else how to do their job 
I discovered very early in ministry that everybody knows what the pastor ought to do, even if they're not called to be a pastor. I'm not sure where this divine revelation everybody thinks comes from, but the chances are, are you ready? You're probably wrong. I don't go around as a pastor and tell everybody how they ought to run their business. I know some basic principles. I can share some biblical truths, but I don't go around telling everybody how to run your business. I promise you, if you was, if, 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 if the ushers were to come to me and say, hey, we want you to run our business for the next two months, your bottom line is going to bottom out. Because I know nothing about your business. And the same with the rest of you. Now, I can pray with you and I can seek God with you and we might get a word about something. And I did really good at the businesses I ran. I've had great success in the times that we've managed or ran or owned businesses. But let me tell you something. It was because I was walking in the grace of that position God gave me at that time. I'm not an expert in everybody else's field. And neither are you. And you get these people who want to go around and tell all these other pastors and all these other men. I, I, get, I get choked up when I see some pastor tell another pastor 3,000 miles away how he ought to. People watch somebody on television. Well, you know, if they were really a church for God, they would do it like this. You shut up because you don't know what God has called them to do. You don't know what. All you know is you think you're right and you uppity. And if you don't watch it, God will humble you in the middle of your uppityness. Think you know somebody 3,000 miles away. And then going to talk about it. You know the Bible says it's a shame to even speak of what the people who are doing wrong. It says it's shameful to even speak what they do in the dark. You're going to sit here and talk about good Christian people and run them down. You're not even supposed to talk about the wicked people and what they're doing. Look at your neighbor and say it's time to hush that stuff. You'll never walk in your grace complaining about everybody else's. Hello? Jesus said you must first remove the splendor from your own eye before you can remove the beam from somebody else's. <laughs> That's kind of harsh, isn't it? Sorry. Not really, because you need to hear it. Because the truth is, you'll never find the fulfillment until you get focused on what you're supposed to be focused on instead of what everybody else is supposed to be. Right? Everyone has an opinion. And, and, and you know, here's the other side of that. It's okay to listen to people. You, you remember the story of Naaman, and he was a leper, and he was a great man, and he went into the far kingdom, and, and, and the servant of the prophet come out and said, just go dip in the muddy river seven times. And Naaman got all mad, and the Bible says, and he was wroth in his anger because he just couldn't believe. He said, I thought he would at least come out and say some words over me and wave his hand over me. You know, I'm, stars were going to pop, and miracles were going to happen, and these great things if he had done it like I thought he was supposed to do. It was the guy that pours out his chamber pot. Anybody know what a chamber pot is? That's the little thing they went to the bathroom in the tent at night. The guy that dumped out his chamber pot, the lowest servant he's got, said if he told you to do a great thing, wouldn't you have done it? And Naaman had the wisdom to receive the word from his servant. So I listen to every suggestion and everything people have to offer. But just because I listen don't mean I'm going to find that that's the way to do it. I listen and I pray about it. And I let experience in the word of God tell me, now is this a word from the Lord? Is this clear instruction from God? Is this, is this really revelation? Is this wisdom? Or is this just somebody's opinion? And if it's just your opinion, I'll just give it back and you can take it back home with you. It's okay. Because not every good idea is a God idea. We have churches full of people who are fighting. Not this church, praise God. But in the world we have churches full of people who are, who are just infighting and struggling with one another. And Usually it's because so many people haven't found their purpose. They're not being used. They're not being activated. They're not, they're not doing outreach. They're not doing witnessing. They're not, they're not ministering to people. They're not fulfilling the purpose of God in their life. 
And so they find all of the fault with all of the things. And then out of their bitterness and upset and miserableness, they bring that to church and they start trying to make everybody try to fix it the way that they think they ought to fix it. And of course, everybody else thinks you have to fix it a different way than you think you have to fix it because everybody else is different and everybody has their own miserable and everybody has their own thing that they're lacking and everybody has their own gifting and their own calling. And it means that they got their own thing that they think is the most important thing in the kingdom. And from everybody's most important thing in the kingdom... The guy who thinks prophecy is number one is battling with the prayer warrior because the prayer warrior just wants to pray and the prophesier just wants to prophesy and they can't get along because one wants the the other one to shut up and the other one wants the other one to start speaking. In the middle of it is God saying, hey, if you just look at me and do what I say, I promise it'll all work. Your praying will increase. Your prophesying will increase. Your working and and giving will increase. The practical people will be happy because we'll do all the practical things. And the spiritual people will be happy because we'll do all the spiritual things. And together, the practical and the spiritual will change the church, change the people, change the town, change the country, change the world. Because the disciples could call down fire from heaven, but they also went and walked and preached Hello? It all comes together in God's plan. The diversities create one unity, which creates the power of God moving upon the earth. Typically, the lack of finding their purpose is what causes people to fuss and fight. But the Bible says that God wants to do a new thing. Can I I challenge you that in finding your purpose, you're never going to find your purpose looking backwards. Nowhere in Scripture does anybody find their purpose by looking back at what God has done in the past. If that was the case, uh, Joshua would have walked up to the river and he would have held out a staff and he would have waited for the water to part. Because that's what Moses did when Moses wanted to cross the water. He took out his staff, the big wind come up, and the wind blowed a hole in the water, and then they all walked through on dry ground, and it was amazing. So, hey, we know what God does. So now you could have, if he was living the day, Joshua would probably watch TBN and see what Moses did, and then Joshua would walk out to the River Jordan, and he would hold his staff up and stand there for three days waiting for the wind to blow, and the wind would never blow, and say, well, I guess God doesn't do this anymore. And instead, the Lord spoke to Joshua and he said, walk out into the water. Joshua took a few steps. His feet had, Moses never even got wet. Joshua had to get wet. Does that make Moses greater than Joshua? Absolutely not. It means that today is river crossing day instead of sea crossing day. God decided to do it like this with Joshua and like that with Moses because it's God that does it. He walks out a few steps and all of a sudden the water's part. There's no wind. There's no, there's no breath that comes and dries it up. The water just begins to pile up on each other and the, the ground is dry anyway. And you know why I love this story? Joshua got wet so nobody else had to. He was willing to sacrifice to make the way for everybody. Come on, somebody. I, I can't stand these people that think that being a leader means you never do anything. Jesus put a towel on and got down and washed his own disciples' feet. You want to lead me, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to show me some service first. I won't follow anybody who refuses to do anything themselves. Because that's not what I see Christ do. God loved me so much that he died for me. He carried a cross, beaten and broken and bruised, and still carried it as far. He went as far as he could go until he collapsed under the weight of it. And they had to have somebody else finish the job. But he still did it for me. You know what that tells me? That means that if Jesus was called to go beyond his capacity to the point where he collapsed, then I really got no excuses to sit back and say, well, you know, this is just too hard for me. God wouldn't put anything on me I couldn't bear. No, no, no. I'll carry it until I collapse, and then God will send somebody to help me carry it the rest of the way. Wow, it's quiet in here. What's the matter? You don't want to carry a weight? You, you don't want to have to do too much? The purpose of Christ. Remember they, when Jesus is, is, is telling the disciples, I'm going to be arrested and I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die. And, and Peter said, no, 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 you're not going to do this. He's like, get behind me, Satan. In another place, well, do you not know? He said, this was the purpose. This was why I came. His purpose was to cross 
to suffer and die, to deliver, to serve, to deliver the world. And then you have people, <laughs> you have people who refuse to sacrifice, and those same people complain that nobody will follow them. Can I tell you something? You have exactly the same number of followers as you have sacrificed for. None for most people. If you're not willing to sacrifice and give and die for them, they're never going to follow you anywhere. Somebody said one time, if you want to know your leader, turn around and look and see who's following you. But you don't even have to turn around and look. If you've never served, if you've never sacrificed, if you've never gave of yourself for others, there won't be anybody there. The unfulfillment and bitterness that which they attack other leaders and other people with isn't caused because nobody's following them. It's caused because they're not fulfilling the purpose of God on their life. Nobody following them is just a result of the problem. Is this too hard today? <laughs> I didn't know this was going to be hard today. <laughs> but it's so true. And when we, driven by obedience and fellowship and the love of God, decide to be moved by that compassion and begin to serve and begin to love and begin to sacrifice and begin to give, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit begins to work in people's hearts and they begin to see something in you and they begin to be drawn to you and they begin to follow you. And that's why the, the disciples, Jesus said, will you leave me too when the 5,000 left? And Peter said, where can we go? You have the words of life. Where to get them? From sacrifice. He learned obedience by the things he suffered, the Bible said. He spent time with God and he loved the disciples and he gave himself to them and, 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 and suffered with them and walked with them and ate with them and loved them. And in his service of sacrifice, he earned a favor in their heart. And when everybody else left, they stayed. And it's not about the crowd. Jesus said, Father, I've lost none of those you've given me. Well, what about the 4,000 in their family? What about the 5,000 in their family? What about all the ones that went away mad and upset and, and, and scorned because they couldn't receive? Oh, you mean they weren't the ones given to him. They weren't his purpose. We spend too many time chasing after people and things. That's not our purpose. We just want to feel successful and we want to feel like we're doing a good thing and we want to feel like people like us and we get all caught up in all of these number games and things and we're not doing what God called us to do because what he called us to do was lay down our life for one another. I don't know how to, I don't know how to say it any more passionately or truthfully to get you to see my desire for every one of you is to begin to discover the purpose, the call, the giftings, the opportunities. So as you begin to feel that purpose, which is always, always, always involves doing something for somebody else. When you begin to fulfill that purpose, God begins to bring a satisfaction, a fulfillment, and a joy. You lay down at night and the stress and the worries of all the little things that bother you and keep you up, they begin to go away. I... <laughs> Oh, God, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to. Outside of a medical condition, if you're laying up for hours and hours at night and can't sleep, I will promise you, you have not found your purpose. I don't care how many good things you're doing. Good things don't fulfill your heart. Walking in the obedience of God's purpose fulfills your heart. You can wear, Martha, Martha, Jesus said, you are full of cares. You are striving to do so many things, but you're not happy, you're not fulfilled, you're not satisfied, you're not sitting in joy. Meanwhile, her sister is sitting at Jesus' feet, and she's weeping, and she's receiving, and she's full of joy. And Martha's saying, your place is to come over here and help me serve. You're a woman. Women are supposed to serve. I need help cooking. I need help serving. The kitchen is a mess. Woman, come help me. And Mary's like, I ain't hearing that right now because I finally found my purpose. It's in Jesus. 
and at the risk of being rejected by society for what they expected from a woman, she stayed at his feet anyway. And when Martha, feeling fully justified and frustrated for being alone, said, Would you tell her to come and help me? (coughs) She sounds like one of these whiny pastors who can't get people to do anything, can't get the church to grow, and they're upset that the next church is big and prosperous and things are going on. You know how I know that sounds that way? Because I was that guy. I pastored a church at eight when I started out. Eight. Which was good because it had six when I started. (laughs) I grew my church like 30%. Sounds better when you say that. Right? Hey, church grown 30% since I've been here. <laughs> Mad, frustrated, upset, nothing worked. Doing every good idea I could come up with to try to draw people, to try to reach people, to try to get people saved. We had tent revivals. We went downtown and talked to people. We did, we did everything in the world that all the books and the teachers all tell you to do to get your church to grow. And one day I'm on the phone and somebody said, when is God going to be enough? And when they was talking about their self and when they said that, my heart was struck like you hit me in the face. Because I realized I had made the size of my church more important than whether or not my relationship with God was sufficient. And I went into a time of prayer and seeking. For six months, I sought God. For six months, I pleaded and I, and I prayed and I, and I opened my heart. God, search me and seek my heart. Show me what I'm wrong. Show me what I need to see. Show me what needs to be changed. I want to be what you want me to be. I, I just want, I want you to be enough. And one night we were in church, and all eight of us, I think we were more than eight at that time. I think we were running about 50, 35, 50, somewhere in there. And I remember the, we showed up on a Wednesday night to have a Wednesday night service. You know, Wednesday night, you got 35 people on Sunday morning. You got like five people on Wednesday night. You got 300 people on Sunday morning. You got like 30 people on team night. By the way, if you're on a team and you're not coming for team night, I'm praying for you. We'll talk later. But I'm... I'm in the middle of seeking God for months and we're having this little service and there's five people showed up and this whole thing started because six months ago I showed up on a, on a Wednesday night and had five people and when I walked out of the church I was so discouraged and mad I didn't understand why do I have to drive 30 minutes to church for five people. That was how bad my attitude had gotten. Just aggravation, frustration from beating against the wall and nothing happening. I was like 20 something years old. In the middle of that service, the Holy Spirit began to move, man, and we had an anointed time of worship, and we had an anointed time of outpouring. When I picked myself up off the floor from just weeping and crying before God, I was so full of joy, and I was so full of peace, and I was so full of expectation and excitement. As I walked out of the church building, I remember praying and saying, God, I don't care if the church ever grows, if it can be like this. And at that moment, it was like I felt the Lord affirm me, you've made it. And I literally stopped on the way down the little sidewalk and thought, my, thank you, Jesus. My heart has been changed. I couldn't change it, but I knew the one that could. And six months later, our church was running 185 people, and we had a new building, and we had just a miraculous whirlwind of change that God brought in, set the church off on a growth spurt that just, just took off. And you know what? I didn't care. (laughs) I wasn't justified or affirmed by how many people came to church. You see, I knew him. He was with me. And that was enough. My number one purpose is fellowshipping with the God that loved me so much that he left the 99 to come and define me in the miry clay that I was in and to lift me up and to set my feet upon a rock. And though I have failed and struggled and got into wrong mindsets and wrong attitudes, he was right there to chastise me and to show me where I was wrong and to help me fix it and to change my heart and to renew my mind. You all can go home if you want to. 
I have him. And that is my purpose first and foremost. And the second purpose of my life is to take what I find in him and to try to share that with you so you can find the peace and the joy and the life change that comes with knowing Jesus personally. Can you say amen? Somebody give the Lord a hand clap of praise. You see, the world knows what to expect from church because we think we know how to do church. We have these little patterns all set up and everybody goes from church to church and they pretty much know what to expect and that's the reason why they stay away. The reason why they stay away is because they think they know what to expect. They think if they come here and they join and they become a part that they'll be let down and they'll be discouraged and they'll be judged and they'll be talked about and they'll be gossiped about and they'll be ran down and they don't want to be a part of that. So it takes people whose heart is really purposed to show them that there's a loving God who has a loving people to reach them and show them it's not what you think. It's not what you think. A word from God obeyed even when it's unexpected can turn a nation around, defeat an army, win a victory, or save a lost soul. Our job isn't to figure it out. Our job is to listen. And when you listen and God speaks and you obey, that's when you will define your gifting, your purpose, your calling, your grace, all culminates together in the will and the purpose of God to change somebody else's life. You want to be a world changer? You do it one heart, one life, one mind at a time. You reach one child, one mother, one man. You, meet, you make one friend. You bring help to one needy person. That's where it starts. But nothing happens until you begin to move. Can you say amen? Stand to your feet with me. Thank you for listening to this message from Fusion Church. You can listen to more messages online at fusionbz.com.